Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of this MOOC dedicated to crude oil atmospheric distillation. In the first video, we defined the concept of cut point. It is now time to see the implementation of the process. The crude is generally supplied to the refinery through a pipe and it is stored in a tank. We start by pumping this liquid crude using a centrifugal pump. For our case, we will pump 500 tons per hour, since this corresponds to the capacity of our refinery. Up to which pressure shall we pump the crude oil? We will see that in a couple of minutes. Just after having pumped the crude oil, the salting water is added. Indeed, as we saw in the first video, it is necessary to remove the salts and especially the chlorides before entering the distillation column. To do this, we inject water which will aim to solubilize the salts and remove chlorides from the crude. The amount of water that is injected is about 5% of the crude throughput, but it should be known that this amount can vary between 4 and 8% depending on the crude characteristics. In our case, the amount of desalting water will be about 25 tons per hour. The crude is heated up to a typical temperature of 130 degrees C to enter a so-called desalter equipment. The operating temperature of the desalter is a compromise to be found between effect of density difference between the water and the crude, but also viscosity of the two phases. In the desalter, the crude will stay for about 20 to 30 minutes. This time is a minimum to let water droplets decant by gravity. Note that in the desalter, an electric field is also applied to help water droplets form a continuous aqueous phase. This aqueous phase is then easier to separate from the crude. It should be noted that this water can be injected just upstream of the desalter or just at the discharge of the crude pump after the tank. To reach 130 degrees C, an energy quantity of about 28 gigacalories per hour is necessary. For estimating this energy demand, we considered that the crude was stored in the tank at a temperature of 20 degrees C. To calculate this energy quantity, we need to know the heat capacity of the crude. This heat capacity is about 0.52 kilocalorie per kilo and per degree C. It simply means that 1 kg of crude oil requires 0.52 kcal to be heated up by 1 degree C. So, to heat up 500 tons per hour of crude oil from 20 degrees C to 130 degrees C, it will require about 28 gigacal per hour. For information, it would correspond to a consumption of about 3 tons per hour of fuel. The pressure will be chosen so as not to vaporize the crude at the operating temperature of the desalter and consider a margin on top of that figure. In our case, we see that the pressure at which the first bubble of gas is formed at 130 degrees C is about 2.5 bar G. We take a margin for the case where the crude would have a higher quantity in light molecules and or in case we should operate the desalter higher in temperature and we will operate the desalter typically 5 bar above this pressure. For our case, 2.5 bar plus 5 bar, say 8 bar G. In the desalter, we have an objective to eliminate about 85 to 95 percent of the salts and thus control the conversion phenomena in the atmospheric column. I remind you that the typical chloride content in the crude varies from 20 to 350 ppm. We expect a chloride content in the crude after the desalter to be between 1 and 3 ppm. The amount of HCl that will be formed at the top of the distillation depends on the residual MgCl2 content. Indeed, the hydrolysis temperatures of the salts are given just here. We can see that 95% of the MgCl2 is hydrolyzed at 350 degrees C when only 10% of the CaCl2 is hydrolyzed at the same temperature. And finally, that of NaCl is purely and simply negligible. 
HCl formation can be limited by adding sodium hydroxide downstream of the desalter between 3 and 5 ppm to convert MgCl2 and CaCl2 to NaCl, which is poorly hydrolyzable. Once the crude has been desalted, we continue to heat it up in a prey train that is called hot prey train, whereas the one upstream of the desalter is called cold prey train. Here, the crude is heated up to the highest possible temperature by covering calories from the products of the distillation. This will be detailed later in the next videos. The typical prey temperature at the end of the hot train is about 250 to 290 degrees C. For our case, a temperature of 280 degrees C will be considered. At this temperature, there are no more calories or any stream that is hot enough to heat up the crude to the transfer temperature in the atmospheric column, which is typically between 370 and 385 degrees C. Again, we aim for a pressure compatible with the fact that the crude does not vaporize in the prey train, and we consider a margin on top of that. In our case, we see that the crude vaporizes at 20 bar G at 2 and 80 degrees C. So, we must increase the pressure to about 25 bar G. Then, the crude flashes in a valve just before the distillation furnace. How much energy does it require? Here again, let's do a heat balance. When heating up the crude from 130 to 280 degrees C, it will require about 47 gigacalories per hour. Indeed, the heat capacity of the crude increases with temperature. It is no more 0.52 kilocalorie per kilo and per degree C that is necessary, but 0.62 at this higher temperature. After the flash in the valve, the crude enters a furnace and vaporizes to reach a temperature of 385 degrees C maximum. At this temperature, we will vaporize some molecules, as we see on this graph. At 385 degrees C and at the pressure at the outlet of the furnace, that is estimated at 3 bar G, we will vaporize about 70% of the crude. Remember, in the first video, we saw that if we wanted to consider 150, 250, 300 and 350 degrees C cut points, we had to vaporize at least 60% of the crude. This 60% corresponds to the sum of naphtha, kerosene, light diesel and heavy diesel. It is therefore logical to vaporize at least 60% of the crude if we want to recover naphtha to heavy diesel molecules. In our case, at 385 degrees C, 70% of the crude oil is vaporized, which is more than the 60%, so this is in line with our objectives. So, you may be wondering about the energy quantity that is necessary to heat up the crude to 385 degrees C. As before, let's do a heat balance. To heat 500 tons per hour of crude from 280 to 385 degrees C, it will require about 35 gigacalories per hour. But be careful, this energy is certainly necessary but not sufficient. Why? Simply because, as just said before, when the crude is heated up to 385 degrees C, it will also vaporize. And the quantity that is Vaporize is about 70% of the crude, or about 344 tons per hour. To vaporize these 344 tons per hour, you have to take into account the so-called latent heat of vaporization, which is in our case of about 50 kilocalories per kilo. It means an additional energy quantity of about 17 gigacalories per hour. So, in the end, the amount of energy that we will have to supply is 35 plus 17 equals 52 gigacalories per hour. This is equivalent to 5 to 6 tons per hour of burnt fuel. If we make the addition of all the energy demand, we see that about 127 gigacalories per hour of energy is required. 
This is equivalent to about 13 tons per hour of burnt fuel, or about 2.5% of the crude. This is huge! We will see in the following videos how to optimize this energy consumption. Here we come at the end of this video dedicated to the preheat train and the salting of crude entering the atmospheric distillation. I let you watch the third part to see what will happen in the distillation tower. In the meantime, do not forget to test your knowledge on refiningisexciting.com or simply look at the description of the video where you can find the link to the quiz. In the meantime, do not also hesitate to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the button. See you very soon for the third part. Bye bye!